Okay guys, I am quite convinced this will be the third and final lecture video for this week. But we got some stuff to get through. We need to talk about some more electron flow. We've got to properly define electricity. We're going to talk about voltage, current, and resistance. Five things, and I want to do this in under 15 minutes. Do you think we can do it? I think we can. I think we're doing it, and let's go now. So we've discussed that electrons are always trying to find a balance if they're moving. If not, they're insulated and they're static. But electrons need a path in order to do so. In an electrical system, typically that's a wire, form of conduit that they move around. But if there's a break in that conduit, in that wire, the electrons just don't go anywhere. Electrons are always moving, right? They're kind of moving randomly in any given direction, but if we're putting them into a system, we're giving them some direction. We're giving them some force. If the wire is broken without an end point for them to achieve balance, they're going to stop and they're not going to move specifically in any direction. Our force means nothing to the electrons without an incentive for them to go someplace. So in that first image at the very top, we see that our electrons, there's a break in the wire. We can force all we want to, but electrons aren't gonna do anything. Um, they're just, there's no incentive for them to move. If we were to complete a circuit, which we'll get into a little more detail in a second, and we can see that electrons will start flowing in the path of least resistance in the quickest format to get to their destination. That's what they do by nature. We can predict and count on that. But there's something weird here. I don't know if you can tell on the right hand side of this image, I put a little extra wire here. So I want you to think about this for a second. What happens at this por portion of the wire? how many electrons are going to go in this direction towards the nothingness, the dead end? And if you answered none, then you are 100% correct. The electrons aren't even concerned in going to dead ends. They're always trying to find a path to complete the circuit. And even if you have wayward wires that go someplace, unless there's an incentive in a way for them to create that balance that they're seeking, it's not going to happen. They're just going to keep zipping around. So in this yellow section right over here, no electrons. They're going to go straight up and towards that destination. No electron flow. And this is important because this is what we start talking about when we're talking about circuits. If we can theoretically create force on electrons and put them in a path of an endless loop, that would be considered a circuit, a never ending looped pathway of charge carriers. Well, when we have circuits, we don't have this never ending theoretical electron flow that's going around in a water wheel, we actually kind of draw them in one direction from a source to a destination based on a their imperative will to find balance. So if you look at the square at the very bottom here, we got some breaks. If we were to pump electrons into this somehow, some way, there would be no movement whatsoever. There's no rationale for the, the charge carriers to move in any direction. But if we were to fill those breaks, then we suddenly have a path. And if we were to put a source or a destination on one side, they would always move away from the source towards the destination. And that's what happens when we throw a battery into a circuit. We can put as many components as we want to in between. And all we have to do is guide or manipulate these charge carriers through a circuit to get to a destination to achieve balance. So what we have right here is my crudely drawn picture of a battery, but this is pretty much what it looks like. I don't know if you've seen this symbol before, but you see, and you'll start to see this a lot more frequently, is this is called a DC or a direct power source. A battery is a direct power source. The power you get from your wall, that's alternating current. We have a whole half of the semester to talk about that. What we're going to focus on this very first half of the term is direct current. Direct current is typically um, less efficient than alternating current, but easier to control, um, easier to manipulate, and a lot more forgiving on our electronic systems. And therefore, that's why we use batteries. So this symbol that you're seeing right here, you're going to see a lot. 
and when we start looking at schematics for electronic plans, you'll see that a wire is typically just a straight line. So you can see this would be considered the wiring of a circuit. And then this symbol right here is always going to represent a battery. It's got stacked parallel lines um, that are horizontal. The bigger side is the positive charge carrier and the negative side is the negative side. If you're looking at a battery terminal, the nipple would be the positive side, the flat side would be the negative side. And like we talked about, that the electrons are rushing around to the positive side, but the positive charge carriers are moving from the positive side around to the negative side. And I know it looks like a funky symbol, but we have to thank Italian physicist Alessandro Volta, who invented the first battery. And the reason why the, <laughs> the symbol looks like it does is because of his original design of the voltaic pile. And what this was is actually pretty ingenious. It's several different types of materials that are conductive and semi-conductive. They allow certain types of energy through under certain conditions and they've biased that stack so that the negative side moves towards the bottom whereas the positive side is slowly moving towards the top. You put two lines on it and you attach them to something you now have a circuit. So now we know what a circuit is it's something with a source and destination with a path, a completed path attached to it. We also know what these symbols look like if we were looking at a diagram of a circuit on paper. And we know why we got funky lines in all of our symbols. All right, I hope that helps clarify the circuit portion. We're going to be going through this the entire term. So don't get hung up on it too much, but just think that it's a completed path with a source and destination for charge carriers to move through. All right, we finally did it. We got to a place where we can define electricity. I didn't think it was going to happen, but we got there. Nah, that's, that's not true. I knew it was going to happen. Electricity is the free flow of electrons between atoms. Simple, right? We spent all this time building it up, talking about electrons, about how some materials allow it, some materials don't allow the movement, and now we have a definition for electricity. The flow of free electrons between atoms. Pretty simple, right? And now that we know all the background information, it kind of makes sense. That's what we're doing when we're manipulating electrical circuits. We're trying to force electrons to go into a specific direction or manipulate that flow. So how do we do that? Because we know that electrons just kind of move willy-nilly whenever they want to, right? You know, but we also know that they have behavior characteristics. They try to create a balance. Well, what we can do is we can have a new definition for a force called voltage. What is voltage? Voltage is the force that pushes electrons around the circuit. Without voltage, electrons would move randomly. They have no direction and they have no inclination unless they have that balance to seek. Well, the difference between that balance is actually the pressure. It's the voltage in which we push electrons through a circuit. And it's only when we apply voltage that we can get electrons and charge carriers to move in the same direction uniformly causing current. We'll talk about current in a second, but that's what it's all about. It's about giving the incentive for moving the electrons in the direction that we want them to go. All right, so we hopped into a little diagram here, and I'm trying to help you get some visual sense of what's going on. If we've got electrons and they have no, they have no incentive to do anything other than randomly float about and try to go into whatever electrons that they can, but that's not good for us if we're trying to manipulate them and make an electrical system work. What we want to do is we want to incentivize them and manipulate them 
by doing a couple of things. First, what we want to do is we want to give them a path, right? So we have our little path here. And we want to complete a circuit, which we talked about, which is giving them a source and a destination. But when we get to a battery, a battery is rated at a specific voltage. Let's say this is a AA battery, 1.5 volts. The, the volt is the unit of measurement and how we describe the incentivization, the force, that's the difference between one end of the battery and the other end of the battery. And when we have the path available to the electrons, that makes a complete circuit, and we have a form of voltage, it's the difference between one side and the other, that's what gets these electrons moving. And now, not only are they moving, but they're moving uniformly together in the direction that we intended them to. And that's basically what it comes down to. You can think of, we're going to get into some more water analogies, but it's, it's the force behind what we're getting the electrons to do. Now, if I could demonstrate this, oh, I got it. This is going to be a little small because I'm on a small screen. I got here this little ball. This is going to be like an electron. And I got one of my kids' guns that I just, they're little, they're little Nerf guns. And this is not unlike what a voltage from a battery does to electrons. I'm actually going to squeeze this guy. Let's see if I can get this in camera. Ah, I can't get it. And I am going to shoot using the force to push this out. If only I give it a little bit of force, a little bit of voltage. It'll barely come out. But if I go go ham on this thing, like a 9-volt battery, oh, man, look at that. That's, this is actually a lot of fun. <laughs> the force that's causing me to pop off these Nerf balls is very similar to the force that's pushing electrons through a circuit or a system. All right, so back to our slide. As we just mentioned, voltage is measured in a unit called volts, and it's denoted with the letter V. Um, to give you some perspective, the batteries that we're all familiar with, AAAs, are 1.5 volts. Those little square bot batteries that we typically use in larger devices, those are 9 volts. So there's more pressure behind the electrons that get them to go where we want them to go. We have to have this conversation, but I don't know if I want to right now. We need to talk about what a Coulomb is. Um, I'm actually going to put together a video specifically on the Coulomb, and I'm going to try and make it under seven minutes. But it's a unit of measurement, and it's specifically the unit of measurement that we're looking at um, the interaction of electrons, specifically six quintillion, 242 quadrillion electrons over a period of time. And that period of time just happens to be a second. Um, we use the Coulomb because it's kind of a standard candle when we're starting to talk about other measurements. One volt is the force required to drive or push one Coulomb, that 6.24 times 10 to the 18th, that number of electrons through a specific resistance of one ohm. We're going to talk about resistance in a second. I feel like the book goes a little bit out of order here, but I want you to know the idea, the concept of the Coulomb. It's a number of electrons, an insanely large number of electrons over a period of time. And we're going to use this to kind of standardize um, voltage, current, and resistance. And you'll understand a little better by the end of this and next chapter. I promise you that. But let's get back into some more voltage. OK, so we've talked about voltage being like line pressure. It's <laughs> the more voltage you have, the more pressure behind the electrons are the charge carriers in a system, less voltage, less pressure. 
and it's very, very similar to a water tower. We're going to start getting into our water analogies. Uh, let's move into that real quick. If you can imagine a water tower, then you can understand the principles of voltage. Let's take this little water tower right here, and we'll fill it up with only a little bit of water. What's going to happen is, if we go down line to any point in the pipe, and we take a gauge of the pressure, it'll raise just a little bit. But the more water that we throw in this water tower, the more that pressure is going to raise. And that's the equivalent of having more voltage. And it's important to note that when you're looking at this gauge, what it's really doing is it's taking a measurement between two different points, even though it only looks like one. It's taking the pressure from outside and comparing it to the pressure in the pipe. The mass of the water is pushing down all the water that's already in the pipe, and it's raising this pressure gauge. Now, when we're looking at voltage, we're doing the exact same thing. Let's see if I can get this down here for you guys. I'm going to use our handy-dandy battery. You know this is the positive side and this is the negative side and if we were to take a multimeter and we were trying to measure voltage what we're really measuring is the difference in pressure and force between two spaces we're looking at the pressure between most likely in a very simple circuit here where the negative side is and here where the positive side is this water tower analogy is actually perfect because we can see that this pressure caused by gravity feeding the water down the pipe increases the pressure buildup here that's measurable. Well, the same thing is happening with electricity. We're measuring the larger the voltage capacity of the battery is more pressure in line on the electrons. And that's why I use the term a voltage drop. We're measuring the drop or the difference in pressure between two specific places in the system or in the circuit. If we're looking at the charge carrier and we're paying attention to the positive side compared to the negative side, we can say there's this much potential energy here in comparison to the negative side. There's far more potential energy at the top of this battery than there is at the negative. And this amount of potential energy is the voltage. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to try and think of some more analogies to get through this. But just think of that voltage being the pressure in a line. And that line just happens to be your circuit. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, voltage, also known as the potential energy or the potential difference, is because you're measuring the two different sides of the battery. And you're trying to get a sense of, you're trying to describe how much more energy one side of the system has in comparison to the destination where the charge carriers are rushing to. When voltage is connected to a circuit and it starts to push charge carriers through a wire, that's when we start to produce what's known as current. Think about current in terms of volume, whereas voltage was the pressure going through the system, the current is much like water, you know, water current is the volume of electricity. A small space allows less current or less volume. Um, a larger space allows more. The analogy I like the most, probably because I absolutely love milkshakes, is I think about sometimes you go to In-N-Out, right? Super thick, amazing, delicious milkshakes. But they give you these tiny little milkshake straws. And you're sitting there sucking with your sinks with your cheeks sunk in and you look all goofy and then 
you think if I had a boba straw, like one of those big fat suckers, you could totally have this shake down in a second. Brain freeze, yes, that's fine. You would still have your milkshake. But instead, you've got this tiny little straw that you're trying to suck through, and you look goofy because of it. If only we could have a bigger straw. Well, that is the difference between current. You're able to get more volume, and that's exactly what the concept of current is in electricity. Current is measured in what's called amperes. Nobody calls it amperes, they just call them amps, and it's denoted with the letter A. So, going back, voltage is pressure, current is the volume of electricity, and we've got one more concept to put a bow on this thing, and we're talking about resistance. And this is the trifecta here. Resistance is the opposition to the flow of electrons. It almost always manifests in the form of heat, and it can come in a number of types. And as all these electrons try to squeeze through a space or rush to a, a form of balance, and you get heat because the, the space, the path that the electrons have to go through are offering too much resistance for the application. Resistance is measured in ohms, and it's denoted with the Greek letter omega. And we're going to learn a lot more about different components that we can put into our systems to create intentional resistance, which is a good thing, in chapters 2 and 3. Also, I wanted to throw this out there. There's a specific component called a resistor that we use to resist the flow of electrons. And that diagram that you see there with the little squiggly line, that's what it looks like on paper. All right, well, we did it. That is the complete conclusion of chapter one. Um, I think you guys are set. If you have any questions whatsoever, please reach out and let me know. We did it. Great, guys. Bye.